before I passed the mic. Um, during the Jim Crow era, um, which was a watershed moment for the South and of course our country, um, W.E.B. Du Bois said, as the South goes, so goes the nation. And those of us who care about and live in the South know that those words are just as true today as they were decades ago. Um, poverty, mass incarceration, voting rights, racial inequality, protecting our air, our land, our water, on issue after issue, what happens in the South sets the tone for what happens across the country. And at our affiliate, our work primarily focuses on LGBTQ rights, um, voting rights, criminal legal system, LGBT, I said LGBTQ rights already, immigrants' rights, um, and reproductive freedom, of course. And at the nexus of all of these are issues of racial justice that we center, right? So we center that in all of our work. Um, we're in the Bible Belt, as all of us know. And being in the Bible Belt, that means that conservative forces hold sway over a lot of things in our lives. Um, and what has happened is that in the South, progressive voices have not been able to build the type of power and um, mass movement that's really possible to create change. And to help address that, in 2019, Southern Collective of the ACLU was born. The Southern Collective is comprised of 12 affiliates. They are Alabama, Arkansas, Florida, Georgia, Kentucky, Louisiana, Mississippi, South Carolina, Tennessee, Virginia, West Virginia, and of course, North Carolina. And our mandate is to address the challenges in the South that are rooted in, its, in our unique history of racial oppression and violence and our equally remarkable history of civil rights struggles and victories. The collective strength lies in our power to share and collaborate for change in a region that is paving the way for racial justice nationwide. So two quick ways in which we do this. The collective focuses on building strong and sustainable affiliates in the South because we're only able to do our work if we're able to have really strong, um, committed people on the ground doing that. And some evidence of how we do this is that we created the Southern Legal Internship Program. And that really puts incredibly talented public interest lawyers to be in the pipeline, in our pipeline, for instance, one example. And then there are other leadership <laughs> development programs that the Southern Collective has developed. And another way in which we do this is that we really work together to try to advance high impact collaborative initiatives across the region to move our work forward. So for instance, the Southern Voting Project falls under this banner. Um, some of the work that we've done under the Southern Voting Project includes uh, a research project to better understand black and Latinx audiences in the South and how to communicate with those groups. Um, and then of course there are like recent cases that we've done in Georgia and Alabama are about voter suppression. As you all know here, because I know you watch the news, we recently got some really you know, interesting maps in North Carolina <laughs> that have split communities, it will dilute voters' voices, it will violate our rights of voters of color. Fortunately for us here in North Carolina, we actually really have a strong um, voter protection coalition. And so what's happening right now is that a lot of partners on the ground, including the ACLU, we're really talking together, thinking through what the legal strategy should be. The other way in which we're really thinking about what's to come in 2024 is that we're working closely with the other C4 partners in the state to develop an electoral strategy that really is within the boundaries of us being a nonpartisan organization, but will be effective in breaking that supermajority that exists right now in the General Assembly. So that's some of what we're doing right now. And as we move towards 2024, we're really looking forward to sharing with you ways in how you can partner with us to help us accomplish this. So I'm just really thrilled that you're all here. Um, I just want to say how appreciative I am um, by your part of, of your partnership. We really couldn't do it without you. Um, when we look at our data over the decades, one of the things we see is that there is this long-standing perception that um, the ACLU needs less support when there's a Democrat in the White House. So I can't tell you how wrong that is because we've seen it um, after um, between after the Patriot Act between Bush and Obama, and we're seeing it now after Trump. So I'm just really thrilled that you guys have all stayed the course with us and really happy that you've decided to continue partnering with us. 
So David is going to tell you when he gets up here how our work has not lessened because there's a Democrat in the White House. But before I turn the mic over to David, let me just read a little bit of his bio. I shortened it because it's really long. <laughs> um, David Cole joined the ACLU as National Legal, Legal Director in 2017. As Legal Director, David directs a program that includes approximately 1,400 state and federal lawsuits on a broad range of civil liberties issues. His team has 100 ACLU staff attorneys in our New York headquarters, oversees the organization's U.S. Supreme Court docket, and provides leadership to more than 200 staff attorneys who work in ACLU <coughs> affiliate offices in all 50 states, Puerto Rico, and Washington, D.C. David has litigated many constitutional cases in the Supreme Court, including Texas v. Johnson and United States v. Eichmann, which extended First Amendment protection to flag burning, and Masterpiece Cake Shop versus Colorado Civil Rights Commission, in which the ACLU represented a gay couple refused service by a bakery because they sought a cake to celebrate their wedding. As the ACLU National Legal Director, he has overseen a wide range of Supreme Court litigation, including cases extending privacy protection to cell phone location data, striking down President Trump's efforts to add citizenship questions to the census, protecting Black Lives Matter protesters from liability for the acts of others, and challenging the Muslim ban, the border wall, and a range of anti-asylum policies. David's victories are many, and I can't possibly list all here. David began his career at the Center for Constitutional Rights. Currently, he is on leave from Georgetown University, where he has taught constitutional <coughs> law and criminal justice since 1990, and he is the Honorable George J. Mitchell Professor in Law and Public Policy. He's the author or editor of 10 books, several of which have won awards, including the Palmer Civil Liberties Prize and the American Book Award. His most recent book, Engines of Liberty, How Citizens' Movement Succeeds, published in 2016, examines the strategies civil society organizations employ to change constitutional law. The late New York Times columnist Anthony Lewis called David one of the country's great legal voices for civil liberties today. So, on that note, I'll turn the mic over to David. Uh, thank you, Chantal, and thank you all for, uh, for coming here. I was actually supposed to come uh, in April of 2020. Uh, and, um, this is the April of 2020 uh, visit. Um, so uh, it's, great, it's, it's, it's great to be here, and I, I couldn't you know, uh, underscore more uh, Chantal's point about the importance of sticking with the fight and supporting the uh, ACLU in times when we don't have President Trump in the office, which um, you know causes in, in incredible headaches for everybody, but causes lots of people to turn to the ACLU. The red states are still the red states. The, most of, um, of what uh, challenges our civil liberties and civil rights occurs at the state level, not at the federal level, and so um, the, the work continues. And, I think the, the, the signal strength of the ACLU is the fact that we have affiliates in every state. We're on the ground in every state. We're not just a national organization in Washington or New York. Um, and so we're able to respond to the particular threats that occur. Um, and they're different in you know, the Southern Collective and in Alaska and in California. And, uh, and there are threats everywhere, but they are very different. So I, I came to the ACLU, I was actually, um, uh, asked by, by the executive director, Anthony Romero, to apply for this job of, of the national legal director in the, in the spring of 2016. And, uh, and Anthony's sort of um, sales pitch to me was, he said, David, you've been, you know, you've been practicing constitutional law and teaching constitutional law and advocating and writing about constitutional law for your entire career, 30 years, 30 some years at that point, under a conservative majority Supreme Court. Just think what it would be like to <laughs> run the ACLU's legal department and Supreme Court practice under a liberal majority Supreme Court. Because, you know, if you think back to the spring of 2016, what did we all know? We knew that Hillary was going to win. She would appoint Scalia's successor, and we would have, for the first time since 1970, early 1970s, a uh, majority liberal Supreme Court. So, of course, I applied for the job. It seemed like a great opportunity. And 
uh, well, you know, somehow got the job, and then I was finishing teaching at uh, Georgetown in the spring, so I didn't, or in the fall, so I didn't start till January 2017. Uh, and uh, on November 8th of 2016, uh, the world changed, and my job changed, and the, the fights that the ACLU had to engage in uh, changed. But it, it's been an incredible, uh, an incredible time to be at the ACLU. Um, we have, you know, from the, I, I started, I think nine days before Trump was elected, he, 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 or, no, before he was uh, inaugurated, the first step he took was the Muslim ban, which he, he was inaugurated on a Monday, Friday afternoon, <laughs> he issued the Muslim ban. Friday, that Friday afternoon, we filed the first legal challenge to the Muslim ban on behalf of two Iraqi men who had gotten visas to come to the United States because they had fought, they had not fought with, but they had worked with the U.S. military in Iraq, and so um, you know, it wasn't safe for them to stay there, but because they were from Iraq, and that's a Muslim country, they were stopped and were not allowed to come in at JFK Airport. We sued on their behalf that Friday night. The we got an emergency hearing the next night, a Saturday night in Brooklyn, freezing cold, rainy night, and thousands of people came down to the courthouse. The courthouse was closed. You know, it was, this was Saturday night. You know, it was not open to the public. But people, thousands of people came to the courthouse plaza to cheer on the ACLU fighting for uh, immigrants' rights and against the you know, Islamophobia of the, of the Muslim ban. And we got the first uh, uh, injunction that very Night. So, it, you know, and it went on from there. We ultimately filed over 400 legal actions against the Trump administration and won many of them. And really, you know, really, he, he lost more cases in, this, in, the, in the courts uh, than I think any president before him. Now he's, he seems like he's continuing that in his private capacity. <laughs> <laughs> his, uh, yes. His testimony today in the civil fraud trial uh, is not the kind of testimony I'd want my witness to do. Uh, but um, so it's been an it's been an incredible time. We've um, grown tremendously. We have really tried to build up and support the affiliates. As Chantal was talking, we have a Southern Collective Initiative. We also have a border state and uh, a, 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 a um, battleground state initiative where we're um, bringing together all the states that are in real battlegrounds to make sure that people people get the right to vote yeah that, that people get the right to vote and that their votes um, uh, votes matter our um, you know we, we, we the, the court sadly is not the court that I was promised but in fact <laughs> is a very very different court uh, six to three Trump inflected court um, which is challenging you know and we've seen that with Dobbs and we saw that with the Harvard affirmative action case, and we've seen that um, with the gun, uh, uh, the gun rights decision out of uh, out of New York. But you know, um, last term was a lot better than I think many people um, expected. So um, in in the two last terms in the Supreme Court, we filed 18 briefs. We usually have about three to four merits cases in the court where we're the counsel for the merit, for the one of the sides. And then we file amicus briefs in any significant civil rights or civil liberties case. So two years ago, we filed 18 briefs. Last year, we filed 18 briefs. Two years ago, in those 18, the 18 cases that we were in, we prevailed in five and lost in 13. And the five in which the court ruled for our side are cases no one here would have ever heard of. Uh, and the 13 included cases like Dobbs and Bruin and, and, and the like. But last term, last term, again we filed 18 cases before this six to three Trump inflected court. And we won, we, we won, or our side won, 12 of those cases and only lost um, uh, uh, six and one, you know, ca important cases on voting rights, the Alabama um, uh, Voting Rights Act case, which has led to a second majority black district in Alabama. The Indian Child Welfare Act, was with, which was being challenged as race discrimination, one of the few federal laws that actually tries to keep um, Indian families uh, together. Um, the court rejected 
that challenge. Out of North Carolina, the challenge to the independent state legislature uh, you know, theory uh, rejected um, by the court. A very important case about the ability to bring civil rights um, lawsuits, private civil rights lawsuits against discriminators uh, under spending uh, clause statutes. Uh, everyone thought we were, we were gonna lose that, won that case. Some important uh, First Amendment victories. So, um, so the, you know, it's not, it's not hopeless before this court. It's not hopeless before this court. This term, uh, we've already argued uh, one case, the South Carolina racial gerrymandering case. Um, argued in early October. We'll see what the court does. The, we won before a three-judge uh, court finding that uh, South Carolina had engaged in racial gerrymandering. The court has taken a series of cases that will determine the scope of the First Amendment on the uh, internet and with respect to social media uh, platforms. Cases that uh, look at whether government officials, when they do their government work on their private Facebook page, uh, should be treated as the government and, and constrained by the Constitution or whether the all bets are off. Uh, cases about whether states can regulate uh, social media um, uh, platforms, content moderation um, uh, rules, uh, and, and a case about whether the government can reach out to social media platforms and say, hey, you know, that, that, that post that you have there about the, the, the elect, you know, the polls are going to be open until three in the morning, so no need to rush to the polls today. That's false. You should take it down, um, whether that's um, uh, permissible. So uh, we're going to see a lot, uh, there's going to be a lot of movement on um, uh, free speech and, and, and the internet. Uh, this term will be involved in all of those. We have just, uh, we, we have a couple of transgender cases. Uh, we were, you know, the, the, the right wing has decided to make transgender uh, issues a real focus of their target. And so we are, you know, whether we like it or not, we are there um, pushing back wherever we can. Uh, and so uh, we have succeeded in a number of uh, circuits in getting the courts to recognize that, yes, it's okay, and in fact, schools must let transgender kids use the bathroom associated with their gender identity. They don't have to deny their uh, gender identity in order to use the bathroom. Uh, but the, um, uh, 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 one of the cases we won in, in Indiana, the school district has hired Paul Clement, probably the best Supreme Court advocate for the right to uh, petition for cert. So that could be up in the court this term. Meanwhile, we have successfully challenged bans on gender-affirming care in about um, seven or eight states across the country. Um, but, uh, and we've won in one court of appeals, and now we and, and our colleagues have lost in two courts of appeals, so we are petitioning the Supreme Court to review that issue. Whether that is whether a state can say to parents, their doctor, and their child who have all decided that they need gender affirming care whether a state can come in and say no you cannot have gender affirming care um, uh, so though the court could take those cases this term the the united states actually just today filed a petition for cert in our case um, challenging the gender affirming care ban uh, in uh, tennessee mifepristone medication abortion uh, is on the docket. The, uh, as, as many of you know, the, um, a group of doctors challenged the FDA's approval of, of um, medication abortion. They filed it in a particular district in Texas where there's one judge who's very, very conservative, and he declared that the, the FDA approval, which had been in place for something like 25 years, was, um, was invalid. The uh, Court of Appeals uh, upheld it on, in a, on, on a narrower basis, but the United States has asked the Supreme Court to review that, So that, and I think the Supreme Court will uh, uh, review that. So this is going to be a, a term that deals with voting rights, that deals with um, speech on the internet, that deals with abortion, and that quite possibly deals with um, basic um, rights of transgender, uh, of transgender kids. So, um, you know, every term in the court is a, is a big one, and we're uh, in there uh, on, each, on each and every one of, 
of, of these cases. Um, but sad, I mean, happily, the Supreme Court is not the only place that we litigate. Um, and we are um, uh, uh, challenging, for, for example, abortion bans across the country in state courts using state constitutional uh, arguments. The federal uh, 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 arguments are, are greatly weakened by Dobbs or basically eliminated by Dobbs, and so we're using um, state court uh, 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 constitutional theories and have succeeded in a number of states in, um, in preserving the right of access to abortion. And in some instances, we're doing it in federal court, as Christine will talk about it in, in a moment here uh, here in uh, North Carolina. Um, and then I, I, we are um, very active on uh, democracy and voting. And we have uh, uh, been engaged in challenging redistricting in Georgia, just got a, a victory in Georgia, victory in South Carolina, now before the Supreme Court, victory in Alabama, victory in Louisiana, um, uh, so uh, victory in Ohio. Uh, so we've had a number of important wins challenging redistricting on either uh, racial gerrymandering grounds or partisan gerrymandering grounds under state constitutions um, or the Voting uh, Rights Act. Uh, and one of the things, one of the, th the things we have done, sort of, to try to respond to the fact that the Supreme Court is not a liberal majority Supreme Court, is we have um, launched something called the State Supreme Court Initiative, which is designed to say, okay, the federal Supreme Court is not so great. Let's look to the possibility of going to state court using state constitutions to develop arguments that go beyond where the federal constitution. Um, requires states to go. And state courts can interpret their constitutions to go beyond the federal constitution. They cannot be less protective, but they can be more protective. And many states are, many state courts are. North Carolina was uh, <laughs> un until it, uh, it, it changed uh, quite dramatically. Um, but uh, so we're not really pursuing this initiative in North Carolina uh, at this point until you do a, a better job of um, <laughs> electing uh, uh, some more sympathetic uh, justices. But we are doing it across uh, the country, and we've had the state sport, Supreme Court initiative in place for just about six months, and they've already fire, filed uh, 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 about 20, 20 in, in 23 cases in 18 different states. So. You know, and it's, and it's not just the blue states, it's a lot of states that have, um, have decent um, uh, state Supreme Courts. State constitutional law is far less developed because for a very long time, civil rights and civil liberties lawyers sort of reflexively went to federal court. Um, uh, but we're, going, we're, we're, we're um, uh, going to state court more often. And then finally, we are, you know, uh, doubling down on our political work. Um, you know, you, you, abortion uh, is going to be won through the political process, uh, not through the courts uh, in the long run here. And every time abortion has been on the ballot thus far since Dobbs was decided, our side has won. The most recent was the Wisconsin Supreme Court vote um, just earlier this year. And tomorrow uh, is the Ohio um, uh, uh, vote. And we've, we've been... Um, we're a huge player in that Ohio, uh, uh, Ohio referendum. We were a huge player in defeating the effort to try to make it harder to change the Constitution in Ohio, uh, which we defeated this past summer. Um, and we have supported that. The National has supported that with uh, several million dollars. But se many of our affiliates in other states have um, have done it. Have have spent significant amounts of money, hundred thousand dollars here, two hundred fifty thousand dollars here, three hundred thousand dollars here, from California, from New York, from states that are not Ohio, but they recognize the importance of this battle and are all pitching in to fight that battle. And that's, I think, one of the real strengths of the ACLU is that we have, we, you know, we we come together where the threats are, and we are able to respond through our collective power in those, uh, uh, in those states. And North Carolina is certainly uh, one of those states, so we're proud 
to, to, to work with you and, and Chantal and Christy and your whole team on, on the challenges here. And we're proud to have your help in working on the challenges across the country. I, you know, I, I will say, I, uh, you know, there are a few times in my life where I felt that the world around me is as challenging as it is right now. You know, you look on the, on the climate front, on the foreign <coughs> policy front, on the, uh, the, the bipartisan divide front, on the kids on screens front, on the, you know, uh, homeless front, on the drug front. It is a, it is a rough world out there. Um, uh, it is just, uh, but I cannot imagine a better place to be given all of these challenges than at a place like the ACLU, a place that is an across the board defender of the values uh, and ideals that make this country great when it is at its best. And our job is to hold it up to that, uh, to, to those promises. Uh, and, you know, ensconced in the Constitution. They're not self-executing. They only work if we work. Um, but they do work if we work. And so thank you all for uh, helping us uh, do that work because it takes all the support of all of you to do it effectively. Uh, and I'm gonna turn it over now to um, Christy who's gonna talk about some of the challenges. If that wasn't depressing enough, <laughs> talk about the challenges closer to home. spread some hope as well because as uh, Dave alluded to, things are grim right now, particularly in North Carolina, particularly with our state appellate courts um, not being particularly receptive to civil rights uh, arguments. We are doing what we can to be strategic about particularly amicus brief work at the North Carolina Supreme Court and the Court of Appeals, maybe where we see a civil rights litigant who represents um, an issue that let's say aligns with the majority of the court's interests in civil rights, we will sort of step in where we agree and offer some commentary. So I, I do want to be clear that we're not opting completely out of state courts, but in terms of what we are doing day to day, um, we, we are doing a lot more work in federal court right now and for the foreseeable future. Um, so I, I want to talk about two areas where we've actually, I think our, our fights have mattered and um, our pushback, it has mattered. Um, and, and one of those is sort of broadly women's rights and reproductive rights at this at critical time. And then also some First Amendment work that we're doing that I'm very proud of. So uh, first of all, um, uh, one of the cases that I've actually been fortunate enough to work with David on and also um, John Sasser, who's here tonight, um, is our effort in Peltier versus Charter Day School. Um, this is a public charter school in North Carolina. In North Carolina, we have a system of public charter schools. They receive public money. They are regulated by the government uh, to, a, to a great degree by the state government. Um, and yet, they were maintaining this school, <coughs> maintaining that it had the right to discriminate against uh, female students by requiring them to wear only dresses and skirts and not allowing them to wear pants and shorts. Um, and so we sued, um, uh, you know, obviously, in the protection theory, uh, gender discrimination theory under Title IX as well. Sorry. It's, uh, oh, yes. So um, in any event, uh, we were successful. And uh, that case went up to the Fourth Circuit uh, to en banc rehearing, um, and uh, we uh, prevailed there. Um, at that point, the charter <coughs> school sought to take this up to the US Supreme Court on a cert petition. And uh, with David's help, um, our partners at National, um, we fought back successfully and uh, managed to stave off cert. Um, so that case is, remains the law in North Carolina that uh, this kind of um, gender discrimination in, in, a, in a, a dress code uh, when, um, when it is a, a public charter school is a form of discrimination that is actionable under the Constitution. And that these char charter schools are in fact um, government entities and they cannot discriminate, uh, be that on gender, be that race. Um, so huge implications for equality of access to education in North Carolina. Proud that we've managed to hold on to that victory. Um, another example of our work on behalf of women's rights uh, is really in the reproductive rights arena. Um, recently, we sued over um, the monster abortion ban that the North Carolina legislature, our General Assembly, rammed through um, with very little, um, 
very, very quickly with very little opportunity for comment um, and amendment. And predictably, the result was a complete and utter mess, a confusing sweeping bill that not only imposed a 12-week ban on almost all abortions, um, but also um, left practitioners, left people who seek abortion care not knowing what they could be um, held liable for not knowing whether they could seek the care that they needed in many cases without risk of prosecution or losing their licenses. And so we um, sued because there were just so many parts of the law that were confusing and conflictory and vague. Um, and after we did that, the legislature was forced to go back and amend the statute because it was so badly written. It was written without care and concern for the very people whose lives it was affecting. They were forced to go back and make significant changes because we pointed out all the things that were just badly written and sloppily done and cruelly um, and carelessly done uh, in that law. Now, we didn't get them to change everything that we um, challenged, and of course, after Dobbs, we have a real uphill battle in ch challenging abortion restrictions. Um, but we did go to court uh, seeking a preliminary injunction to stop um, two provisions going into effect, one which would have effectively banned medication abortion in the earliest uh, stages of pregnancy, a very vague um, provision of the law, and another that would require that people seeking abortion care under the rape um, and incest exception go to a hospital to get that care instead of a clinic where they can get trauma-informed, knowledgeable, safe treatment. Um, and I'm proud to say that we won that preliminary injunction. We have succeeded in um, restraining enforcement of that part of the law, so that part of the law, those parts of the law are not in effect for the time being, and we'll see how the case progresses. But I think that was a huge victory post Dobbs. Uh, one of the one of the uh, bases on which the court um, enjoyed one of these provisions was on rational basis review, which under equal protection doctrine is incredibly hard to get that kind of restraint um, put on government action under that standard. But I think it's telling uh, about just how bad this law is that the court really saw that there was no rational basis to make rape victims go to a hospital to receive abortion care. Um, so. Um, Wanting to pivot now a little bit to some of our uh, First Amendment work, um, which may be of interest, um, in, particularly, in particular <coughs> our work to uh, protect the right to protest. And um, in that vein, we had success in, again, challenging um, blatantly unconstitutional uh, provisions of law that was passed by the General Assembly as part of the Anti-Riot Act, of course, um, the General Assembly decided that it was time to uh, amend the law that had been on the books since 1969 when we had the summer of protests, the Black Lives Matter protests of 2020. Uh, Maine attempted doing it, didn't succeed right after uh, the summer of 2020, but then came back and succeeded this year in putting um, increasing criminal liability um, and civil liability for people who are deemed to be rioting in the, in the course of um, protesting. Uh, one, of the, one of the provisions of the law blatantly contradicted Supreme Court precedent, which says that uh, the right to urge violence is in fact protected. Um, and uh, so we sued saying that you can't do that. <laughs> it's very clear under the precedent you cannot do that. And the legislature was forced to go back and change that part of the law and strip that out. Um, and that's just incredibly important because I think when we have these very sort of overbroad uh, provisions in, in the law uh, uh, governing quote, quote, quote unquote rioting, what we're going to see is people who are present at the scene of violent activity getting prosecuted even though they themselves are not participating in violence. Um, they happen to be present at a, a protest where violence breaks out, but they themselves are not participating and that should be protected. And so that's what we, what, what we are standing for in that case. We continue to, um, to proceed with that case because we are challenging the definition of rioting, which is still overbroad and vague, and still has the potential to sweep in entirely nonviolent conduct when other people are engaging in violence in the vicinity. And we want to make sure that people are protected when they are trying to participate peacefully in protest. And then finally, um, one of our ongoing cases where we just filed a motion for a preliminary injunction is to protect the rights of protesters in Asheville, North Carolina, who have been working in parks to support unhoused people who are living in parks, they don't have anywhere else to go. It's incredibly expensive to live in Nashville. Um, and, uh, you know, this is a community of activists that have been protesting um, the housing situation in Nashville, have been offering mutual aid to um, unhoused people in the parks, and were um, 
accused of felony littering, which nobody in North Carolina is ever charged with, but these activists were, um, and banned from the city parks for three years, and uh, some, quite summarily without having, having actually been convicted of any crime. And so we are protesting those bans as a violation of due process and first, the First Amendment rights of our clients. Um, so that is just starting and underway um, in terms of uh, waiting for a court decision on that in that case. But I'm, I'm very proud and excited of the work that we're doing there. And that's a case where we're doing it entirely ourselves. You know, we, we're fortunate <coughs> to partner with National ACLU on many things. We're fortunate to partner with, for example, Planned Parenthood on our abortion case. But this is a, a situation where we felt, you know, we were poised to go in and support people um, who needed that, that community support. So, um, and that's just one example of what we've been trying to do. Um, so with that, I will I was remiss and then I forgot to introduce our board president, Jefferson Parker. Oh, yes. <laughs> Wave Jefferson. <laughs> and then we're gonna open it up for questions. So if anyone has questions for Christy or David, shoot. <laughs> Question for David or for both of you, really. Um, you went through the great list of uh, states where you've had success and uh, against gerrymandering and you know, the redistricting and so forth, and you alluded to the Supreme Court situation here in North Carolina. What can we do, uh, given the, the situation here, if anything, to push back on the redistricting? Or what's the what's the plan, or what should the plan be for any of us? <laughs> I mean, you know, it's it organized, organized. Yes. Uh, it, it, it is um, the, the the redistricting uh, challenges are um, are are very powerful, and uh, you know the the, the, the temptation uh, for the party that is in power to you know to, to 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 draw the map in a way that makes sure they stay in power, no matter whether the voters want them to stay in power or not is is, is uh, incredible. And so as long as redistricting is done by the legislature, that's what we're gonna have. And um, so some states have uh, banned partisan gerrymandering under their constitution. The Ohio uh, Constitution, for example, through a referendum banned partisan gerrymandering. And we were able to successfully challenge two maps that, they, uh, uh, that the legislature drew there on that. Uh, on that basis. Uh, other states have uh, sought to put the redistricting um, job into the hands of independent an independent commission, not the legislature, legislators whose jobs are at stake. Um, and that uh, has worked quite well in those states, but it can be very hard to do that if the legislature's you know, in, in, in the way. I don't know enough about your your constitutional amendment by referendum process to know whether that's something we can do. So, yeah, so then, I, but, but, I, but I will say this, I think the notion that the legislators shouldn't be able to choose their, you know, um, their constituents, the constituents should be able to choose their representatives is a pretty powerful idea. And the, uh, the, the sort of blatant way in which in many places, I mean, Wisconsin is probably maybe the worst, but maybe, I don't know, North Carolina is close. Um, <laughs> that, um, that legislators are abusing this power, you know, at some point that's gotta come back and, 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 and bite them. Um, but only if people organize, only if people, you know, demand that this, uh, that, that this change. Because um, the, the courts, you know, you're, you're you had, a, you had a victory in the North Carolina Supreme Court, and that was taken away by the reconstituted North Carolina Supreme Court. The federal uh, Supreme Court has said that this is partisan gerrymandering is not something that it will uh, deal with, and so you have to deal with it politically through your um, through whatever avenues you have. I, I don't have anything to add to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but can can since. Partisan gerrymandering is okay, but with the maps they've drawn, can it be shown that some of it could be shown to be racial? In other words, some of it almost must be racial to get the 10 to 4 or 11 to 3 yeah. districts they have and go with that, which is unconstitutional? Yeah, yeah, and that's, I mean, that's what we did in, uh, in South Carolina. The South Carolina um, 
you know, it's, it's interesting that, you know, nobody really wants to come out and say, we're doing partisan gerrymandering. Right? Our legislators do. Oh, yours do. Okay. <laughs> Generally speaking, they don't. So in South Carolina, during the redistricting process, they, they said, the Republicans said, we're not engaged in partisan gerrymandering. No, 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 no. Then we sued them for racial gerrymandering. And racial gerrymandering you can't do. Partisan gerrymandering you can do. So they said, oh, oh no, we weren't doing racial gerrymandering, we were doing partisan gerrymandering. <laughs> and the whole trial was about whether they were using race as a proxy for politics. And if, they, if they're using race as a, as a proxy for politics, which they often do because race is so highly correlated with, with how people vote, um, then uh, that, is, that is unconstitutional. That's how we won. Uh, in, in, in South Carolina, but uh, in a lot of the cases that we are now litigating on racial redistricting, that, that is their defense. Their defense is it's not race, it's politics, and our response generally is if you're using race as a proxy for politics, that's still unconstitutional under, uh, un, under uh, our constitution. So, yeah, so sometimes you can use, um, and you know, and if we, if, you know, if, if, uh, we were able to get a majority, you know, Democratic majority. We're a nonpartisan organization, but if we were able to get a Democratic majority in the House and the Senate uh, in 2024, we could pass voting, uh, you know, a, a, a John Lewis um, Act, which would uh, amend the Voting Rights Act, which would make it much more powerful, much more powerful tool to deal with uh, some of this. So referencing a New York Times article from about, I think, a week ago where they're talking about Trump um, using lawyers to help him take more control yeah. within the executive branch, um, I'm assuming that, God forbid, he were to get elected again, um, that that would be something that you all might work on in the courts if you found something that was... Oh yeah. <laughs> we filed 400 legal actions against Trump last time. We'll, we'll, we'll be doing you know the, the same or more. Um, I think the concern is that if he actually were to get elected again, uh, he'll he'll you know feel like I can double down. And, yeah. You know, if I you know when he got elected the first time, he said he could shoot someone in the middle of Fifth Avenue and get elected. Now he can say I can, I can you know start an insurrection and I can get elected. And, you know, it's, it's, so it'll be. Very, very scary if that happens. I, I know. I, I still, I, I'm still quite um, hopeful that it won't happen. But the poll that was reported, what was it this morning or yesterday? Not very, uh, uh, you know, very, very disturbing. Um, uh, uh, so, but yes, absolutely. If, if if he's using lawyers to try to undermine separation of powers principles and the like, that are ultimately, you know, separation of powers principles are about protecting liberty. They are about ensuring that government can't overstep, that there are checks and balances. So, um, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I'm Jennifer Lawrence. Um, I'm but it takes a lot of organizing and that it takes all of the organizations working together. And so we are working in coalition spaces in every single issue area that you can think of. We're working with grassroots groups in rural parts of North Carolina. We're working in uh, what we call the anchor counties, you know, Wake County, Orange County, Chatham County. We've really got to focus on right now the, all the organizing needs to be to break that super majority. And so getting out uh, people of color in voting and getting out people in the anchor counties to vote because the, the very first step and you know it's sad I wish we could say like this is just like a two-year plan and then we're gonna have power back but the truth is is that it's not it's a long plan um, but the very first step of that is breaking the super majority is holding on to the veto right so keeping Mark Robinson out of the governor's mansion but then also breaking the super majority and so just got to all 
pull together. And I know it sounds very like simple and very cute, but um, I think going into 2024, we're more organized, all the progressive organizations. I, I haven't been around for a whole lot of election cycles, but everyone tells me that we're more organized and more on the same page and more coordinated than we have ever been before. So that's really what it's gonna take. I mean, the only thing I would add is, I mean, is that um, yeah, you have to have the you have to have the long game, um, but uh, but also sort of uh, I think the one silver lining of DOPS is that it has gotten people to recognize that they need to exercise their rights to protect their rights and exercise their voting rights to protect their uh, reproductive rights, and so wherever that issue has been on the ballot, it's been. It's come out in in in, uh, in a way that favors reproductive rights, and if you know if the <coughs> Democrats do well in 2024, it will be because of Dobbs and because people didn't respond to Dobbs by sitting back and saying, "Oh my God, they took away our right. What are we going to do?" But instead, <coughs> responded by organizing, by engaging in coalitions, by getting out the vote. That's just the way you know we have to work. I, you know, I think about. When I was in law school, which was a long, long time ago, but uh, when I was in law school, one of my classmates at, at, this was at Yale Law School started the Federalist Society. And he was like the, the, the odd man out in law school. Like, who is this guy? And what is he starting? You know, he, you know, and, he, and he started it because he felt hopeless. And he wanted to do something. And oh boy, did he change the world, right? I mean, he, he really. And, the, and you know, the same thing is true with marriage equality. You know, the uh, uh, the, the ACLU brought a marriage equality case in 1976 in Minnesota, and to the Minnesota Supreme Court. And the Minnesota Supreme Court thought the case was so frivolous that they didn't even ask the lawyer for the ACLU a single question during the argument. And one of the justices turned his back on the lawyer for the ACLU for the entirety of the argument. And then about a month later, they issued their decision saying, of course there's no right to marriage equality, um, citing the book of Genesis, not usually a constitutional authority. Uh, and, and we then asked the Supreme Court to review the case, and our claims were due process and equal protection. And the Supreme Court unanimously rejected and said, this doesn't even raise a serious federal question. And in 2015, the Supreme Court recognized the right to marriage equality, and it did it on the same arguments that it had rejected as being not even presenting a serious federal question in 1976. So, you know, and how did that change? It changed not because our arguments changed, we were making the same due process and equal protection arguments, uh, it, you know, it, and the court, yes, the court changed, but the court was actually more conservative in 2015 than it was in the early 1970s, um, it, you know, the world changed, and the world changed because or people worked through organizations and through coalitions to, you know, encourage gay folks to come out and be active and uh, and and work for incremental change here and there and lay the ground for that change. So it's the only way that change comes about, you know, short of revolution, which you know, I, I, I personally, I I don't want to be, uh, you know, uh, revolutions. Maybe sometimes they're good, but uh, they're usually pretty hard for the people who are living through them. Uh, you know, so most change is incremental. We, you just have to keep at it and um, work through effective civil society. Do you think marriage equality is under, th under threat? I don't. I don't. Why is that? I don't think they're, um, I, I think, you know, Dobbs, was, I mean, abortion was, and Roe versus Wade was their sort of bet noir. That was the real, um, uh, you know, that, that, that was the one that, that they both felt was sort of the, the, the kind of, um, uh, it was wrong in its methodology, and it was fundamentally wrong in terms of morality, and so they were willing to overturn 50 years of precedent to reach that result. I don't think they care that deeply about marriage equality. Uh, I don't think it threatens uh, them in the same way that abortion uh, uh, d does and, and, and did, uh, and and, and um, you know when they wrote when they wrote the decision, they they made it clear both Alito and Kavanaugh went out of their way to say um, we don't mean we're 
you know, rejecting the right of privacy, which protects all these other things. We think it's different when you're talking about a right which leads to the, the end of somebody else's life. And, um, uh, and so, you know, uh, will they stick to that? I think they probably will, but, um, you know, if we don't continue to push and fight and advocate and stand up, then maybe they will go further. Feel free to epidemic. There's now this idea, once again, that we can somehow arrest our way out of the issues that our society is facing with you know, overdose. And is, are there any remedies that ACLU can be involved in to you know, have an impact on you know, what district attorneys and sheriffs and police departments feel like they need to do to you know, address the opioid epidemic with that type of yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, and this is this is an area where, um, you know, I think you do actually see some positive change over the last, uh, you know, 20, 25 years, and that is on criminal justice and um, uh, over incarceration and uh, overly harsh punishment. And, you know, you've and we've been very much in all of these battles, the battles to decriminalize uh, drugs, the battles to reduce um, uh, harsh sentences, the battles to elect uh, progressive prosecutors, um, and uh, you know, from 19 something like 1976 to about 2005, the incarceration rate in the United States you know, looks like this. It's a straight up. You know, if you invested in it, you would be doing really well, right? It would just went up, 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 up. Um, but 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 people started you know really started uh, fighting back and around 2005 um, to now for now you know 16 18 years it has dropped the, the the rate of incarceration in the United States has dropped and that's because there was a, um, a concerted effort on behalf of activists to educate about this. You know, books like The New Jim Crow, you know, everybody reads The New Jim Crow now in, in high school, in college, uh, or Just Mercy, uh, Brian Stevenson's book. You know, everybody reads those books. And so there was a real effort to kind of get people to see what's going on here. There was a tremendous effort to organize. And we had a $50 million campaign over uh, about 10 years to called Smart Justice that was uh, at, at the state level to tr try to figure out ways to reduce uh, mass incarceration. And it was a bipartisan effort. Um, right, the right wing also saw this as a problem of big government, as wasteful, uh, and the like. And so we were able to um, achieve significant uh, results. Um, it's threatened now, it's under threat now, in part because crime is rising in some places, in part because the Republicans have decided to make this a, um, you know, a, yet another kind of wedge issue. But there are still, you know, but, but the kind of the, the understanding <coughs> of mass incarceration as not the solution to the problem, I think is so much broader today than it, than it was then. And so I think we can continue to build and continue to fight against that kind of response. As, as bad as the gerrymandering issue is, Citizen United is also an, an issue that affects voting rights and the equality of uh, one person, one vote, and threatens our democracy. I'm, I'm confused about ACLU's position yeah, you're confused or you don't like it. <laughs> so okay, so Citizens United. So so you know I think, um, uh, you know I I, I I agree with you. I agree with you that uh, that campaign finance reform is absolutely critical, and that the, the 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 effect of money on politics and the effect of the wealth gap um, is a real uh, a real driver. Uh, of you know, the obstacles to reform in all kinds of areas. Um, so absolutely critical. Uh, you know, on Citizens United, I think the, a the ACLU's position is one, when the government regulates 
how you can spend money on politics, that's a First Amendment issue. You know, it, it, so people say, well, money is not speech, right? People say money is not speech. That's the mistake. You shouldn't say that money is not speech. But when the government regulates how you can spend your money on speech, that is a First Amendment issue. If the government said you can only spend X amount of dollars on books, we wouldn't say, oh, that's money, not speech. You know, if the government said you can only spend a certain amount of money on, you know, the press, we wouldn't say, oh, no, that's not a First Amendment issue. That's money, not press. No, when you, when they, so, so I think it is a First Amendment issue when the government uh, restricts the amount of money you can spend on politics, on, uh, on campaigns. So that's number one. The second thing that people say is wrong with Citizens United is corporations, people have rights, not corporations. Well, I don't know about that. The ACLU is a corporation. I think we have rights. The New York Times is a corporation. I think it has rights. Ben and Jerry's is a corporation. I think it has rights. Corporations are just um, people who have come together under a particular kind of form. Uh, and, and so I don't think that's that part of, and I'll be, the ACLU doesn't think that was wrong with respect to Citizens United. What Citizens United did, which I think is, is wrong, is it then said the only legitimate interest that the state can pursue in regulating money in campaigns is quid pro quo corruption, meaning, you know, I'll give you, you know, uh, $5,000 if you vote for my, you know, bill. That's corruption. But that's not the kind of corruption that, you know, um, campaign finance reform is designed to address. It's designed to address the corruption in which <coughs> politicians uh, pay more attention to the wealthy than they do to their uh, ordinary constituents. Not because they're getting a bribe, but because they have the ability to support their campaigns in a, uh, you know, in a much more fulsome way. And that broader understanding of corruption would permit a broader range of um, of campaign fin finance regulation. So it's a, you know, it's a, I, I probably didn't answer your confusion or your dislike of our position, but uh, you know, it, it, I will say this, it's an issue on which the ACLU is quite divided and has been quite divided. And uh, in fact, about 10 years ago, shortly after Citizens United, we, the board decided to have a debate on Citizens United, and they brought in Floyd Abrams, the great First Amendment lawyer who represented Citizens United, to, um, to, to, to represent that side. They brought in Burt Newborn, who was one of my predecessors as the legal director for the ACLU and is a very strong proponent of, um, of campaign finance reform and that, that it's consistent with the First Amendment, and they had a debate, and then they voted. And the vote was pretty much 50-50, but the, uh, the, the, not enough to change uh, the, the ACLU's policy. So I, you know, I think if we took another vote right now, I think probably the different outcome would uh, come. So, but it's a, it's a, it's a, I would say it's a hard issue. It is not an issue, I, I don't think, I think the, the sort of the, the sound bites you hear, money is not speech and, and people have rights, corporations uh, don't, those are, I think those are actually wrong. And those sort of undercount how much of a First Amendment interest there actually is. But to say there's a First Amendment interest doesn't mean the government can't regulate. It just means courts should make sure the government has a, uh, you know, a good um, uh, reason for doing so and it's doing it in a narrowly tailored way. And why should we care? Because who's doing the regulating, right? Who's passing campaign finance laws? The same people who are gerrymandering and who are care about their jobs, right, and holding their jobs and are self-interested. So, you know, it's a, it is a very um, tough, uh, uh, very tough uh, issue. But, um, so there's my, there's my not, not very satisfactory answer. Right, we, need, we probably need one more question just so we don't end on that kind of thing. I do know that they're going to take the food in 15 minutes. So that's a compelling factor for anyone. But yeah, I think one, one more question. question. If there is one pressing. No. Now, Citizens right. United. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Who's the Paul Comer on our side? Yeah. 
Who's the Paul Clement on our side? There are many people on our side who are, I mean, Paul's, Paul's fantastic, uh, fantastic advocate. Jeff Fisher, who's at the, the Stanford um, Supreme Court Clinic, is an incredible, uh, uh, incredible advocate. Elizabeth Prelogger, who is the current Solicitor General of the United States, uh, very young, very, very talented. Uh, uh, advocate Seth Waxman. I mean, we we have we have some very good uh, Supreme Court advocates on our side of the aisle. But you know, I you know I, I, I when I started out as a lawyer in the 1980s, um, some of my mentors, one of whom um, uh, John knows, was, it was Morty Stavis. Another was Bill Kunstler. Another was Arthur Kenoy. These were these kind of legendary civil rights lawyers of the 60s. And, and my, my mentor at the time said, yeah, well, yeah, they were legendary. Yeah, they were legendary. But they had an easy time of it. Because <laughs> look what the court was like, right? And it's the same, to, for now, it's the same on the other side, right? You can win a lot if you're conservative before the court without being particularly good, right? <laughs> uh, and so, you know, it's, it's, it's tough. But we have a, there's a lot of really talented advocates uh, on our side, a lot of talented advocates on their side. Um, and, and I think at the end of the day, <coughs> these battles, yes, they come to a head in the Supreme Court often, but they are actually won out there in the community. And they're won by the, you know, the sort of work day to day of civil society organizations, people coming together to defend the values that they believe in. That ultimately will be much more powerful than Paul Clement. Uh, so uh, that's, that's where my uh, faith lies. Thank you.